after many proposals in Parliament for the evacuation of schoolchildren in the event of war, the government agreed that a limited number of camps should be built. The recommended number was a hundred, later reduced to fifty. The result was the Camps Act of May 1939. The building of the camps was given to two non-profit making bodies, the National Camps Corporation for England and Wales and the Scottish Special Housing Association. £1.2 million was provided for construction, maintenance and management of approximately 50 camps, each designed to hold about 300 persons. It was hoped that the buildings would be used for school camps and camps for holiday makers in peacetime but in the event of war they could accommodate people for whom it would be difficult to billet in private houses. However, some months after the war had begun, a progressive education authority realised the opportunity offered by the camps and other education authorities quickly followed. Soon the remaining camps were taken, but according to a report by the National Camps Corporation in 1941, the number of camps being run by the Board of Education was 30, and these were for the education of secondary school children. The Pipewood site, originally administered by the National Camps Corporation, was acquired by Birmingham Education Authority in 1940 as a place in the country away from the expected air attacks on Birmingham, where girls between the ages of 10 and 15 years could continue their education in a calm and settled environment. The scheme envisaged by the authority was both interesting and imaginative, and in practice it was pronounced a success by its many visitors. Evacuation for me, yeah, I feel was different and rather special. Birmingham had two of these, one for boys at Shooting Bots Cannock Chase, and the girls' camp was at Pipewood, Blithbury, near Rugeley, which was open in June 1940. I was fortunate enough to hear about it in January 1941 and two of us chose to go there instead of the majority of girls from Pitmaston who were going to Leicestershire. On the day that we were due to go, the other girl didn't turn up and so I went not knowing anyone. Not to worry, as we all soon made friends. Some I still have contact with. The school was a cluster of wooden huts accommodating 240 pupils. Five of the buildings were dormitories, where we slept in bunk beds. Other buildings were the usual classrooms, the school hall, plus a large dining room, wash blocks, and a small hospital. There were 35 acres of grounds, and we had woods and fields for recreation and free time. Living and sleeping wasn't just school, as there was so much to do. We weren't confined to four walls of a classroom, as so many lessons were practical. Geography was mainly at the local farms and included gardening on our own half acre field and later our own individual small patch where we would grow carrots, lettuces and radishes for our parents. In domestic science we would split into groups, one for laundry, one housework, and the favourite, cooks, who would cook lunch for the whole class. We kept rabbits, hens and ducks, and we also kept bees. Days were very busy with no time for loneliness. Staff were also our mums and friends with time for the individual. A typical day was perhaps Morning call and showers about 7.15am, followed by prayers and breakfast. After breakfast, we would make our beds and generally tidy up. Then came morning school, lunch, rest hour, more school until tea time, then free time or activities. In winter, we sometimes had free time in the afternoon and school in the evening. Free time and activities would include walk, picnics, film shows, dance evening. We learnt ballroom dancing and concerts. The boys learnt first aid with us and we taught them to dance. Pipewood, looking back, was most progressive and we had a wonderful time, although there were times we wished we were back home. We did have the choice of going home for holidays if air raids etc were quiet, 
but lots of the girls stayed at school when special treats were arranged. Christmas at school was very popular. Our teachers were great. We respected them and I think they us. Pipewood taught us a lot, such as living together, putting us on a sound footing for later life. The headmistress wrote many letters to parents. The cyclostyled letter went out to parents practically every month. The first letter was dated June the 14th, 1940, one week after camp's opening. Parents were assured that the headmistress would write to them at once if their daughters were really ill. In another letter from the headmistress, parents were told that visiting days would be on Saturday and Sunday, the 11th and 12th of November 1940. Chef was arranging a sixpenny sandwich lunch for visitors. Extracts from letter concerning secondary and commercial school examinations. August the 17th, 1940. If you wish your daughter to sit for the secondary or commercial school, will you inform me by return? Extract from the letter, July the 14th, 1941. The greatest experience for us all this July month was the service at Hampstall Ridway Church on Thursday, July the 10th. The school walked there along lanes edged with honeysuckle and wild roses to the lovely old church, decorated by the girls with great bouquets of wild flowers. The walk from Pipewood Camp to Hampstall Ridway Church. Time taken. One. From the camp to the reservoir, one mile. 2.55 p.m to 3.12 p.m. equals 17 minutes. 2. of miles. 3. Direction from camp, southeast. We descended 50 feet to 12 p.m. equals 17 minutes. 2. Distance to the church, one and a half miles. 3. Direction from camp, southeast. We descended 50 feet between camp and the church. Norma, from Pipewood Notebook, held by Norma. Miss Evans Rose asked me if I remembered anything about Hamstall Ridway Church and our lessons on a history book in stone. I certainly do, and would love to visit the church again. I remembered it dated from the 11th century, I think, the leper squint, the remains of the chain which used to be attached to the Bible to prevent theft, and the fact that we took a detail out of one of the stained glass windows as a design for a cushion cover, which I embroidered. I still have it, although it's a bit worn now. Hilda. In each dormitory were 24 double-decker beds. At each end was a small staff bedroom. In the middle of the dormitory were chairs. It was here that we all met at bedtime for talking together and for prayers. At the side of each bed was a locker for clothes and for any particular treasures. We had an assortment of little jugs for different colours and whenever possible each jug was filled with wildflowers from nearby hedgerows and put on top of every locker. Although the lessons were mainly the same as other schools, some were a little different. When the weather was fine, many art lessons were taken outside. This was fine when drawing trees and fields, but when it came to the clouds, there were cries of, Oh, but they don't keep still! Ethel. Art lessons outdoors, painting, a field of wheat stooks recently gathered by the farmer. Elizabeth.
the after-dinner rest period had uses other than rest. On Saturdays, clothes came back from the laundry and were given out and checked. Any essential mending was done by the girls as they sat on their beds. Now, laundry charges. Towel, one penny. Pyjamas, sixpence. Vest, a penny. Knickers, a penny. Socks, a penny a pair. Stockings, tuppence. Liberty bodies, a penny. Petticoat, fourpence. Blouse, fourpence. Handkerchiefs, a halfpenny for two. Total cost for essentials, one and fivepence, excluding petticoat. Jumpers, dresses, that sent occasionally, sixpence each. Slacks, ninepence. Tunics, sent once a term, sixpence. This was in the logbook of 1940. It's Parents' Day and we all wait with great excitement at the gate. June. Visiting days best of all, but not if your parents didn't call. Margaret. What about the walls in the dining hall? They were covered in murals painted by Miss S.J. and artistic girls of scenes depicting the goings-on around the school, i.e. gardening, dancing. They were beautiful. Well, I thought they were. That was when I learned another word and its meaning. Mural. Lorna. The dining room where we all ate. The murals on the wall. A voice at your shoulder saying, sit up straight. How I remember it all. Air raids, 25th of June 1940. Air raid warning, no enemy activity. 29th of June 1940. Bombs were dropped two or three miles away in fields. The camp manager told the headmistress that air raid shelters were to be provided. 8th of August 1940. A bomb was dropped in a field half a mile away. The girls were taken to the shelters. 1st of September 1940. It had been decided that all girls and staff would sleep in the shelters from Sunday, the 1st of September. Thank you.
Those young and very precious years have passed so quickly by. But we still remember Pipewood and we heave a kind of sigh. Those dances and those old film shows, the tuck shop and all that. And of course, we all remember Miss Evan Rose's cat. Kathleen, 1987. With a continuation of vigour and enthusiasm, and with sights set on high standards in all aspects of the curriculum, Pipewood offered to its pupils a really comprehensive education, and one which recognised the equal importance of each individual. The managing director of the National Camps Corporation was Sir Edward Howarth. He was a welcome visitor to Pipewood.